It's time to down your unders. Down your unders. Review and dissection of content from some of the sharpest minds in the game. Hosted by Adam Camilleri. Art of War. Down Under. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode 67 of the Art of War Down Under podcast. My name, as always, is Adam Camilleri, and I'm joined by two intrepid travelers. Um, part of the hive mind, different tendrils. One from the, the Great White North and one from uh, the, I don't know, the orange growing bottom right south. I don't know. It's John Lennon and Alex McDougall. Hello, gents. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> bottom right south. That's definitely where Florida resides, right? Yeah, that's good enough. I mean, I've, I've heard it called a lot worse than that, so I'm actually willing to accept us. <laughs> um, America's Wang. <laughs> well, well, well said, gents. Now, we are here to review part two of Octarius, um, whatever it's called. I can't even remember the name of this one. It's not like Book of Rust, Book of Fire. Octarius 1 is what I've got. What is it called? I think it's Rising Tide. That's, that sounds good. It should be Leviathan Rising or something cool like that. Leviathan Rises. I don't know. But anyway, we're here to talk about the nid portion of this book. Uh, gentlemen, I know you are both absolute hive minds and uh, are joined in all intents and purposes, sharing long protein strings, if anybody remembers that episode of The Simpsons. But uh, <laughs> first and foremost, tell you guys a little bit about Art of War before I let these guys talk at all. Um, this is a two-part podcast. First cut, part, lovingly created by myself and Seamus Roan, an overview for general consumption on Tuesday mornings. And you can also find us on the Art of War 40K.com, where you can purchase this podcast in addition to two further podcasts, that being Art of War Unbroken and the flagship Art of War Vanilla Goodness. Or you can come over to Patreon and join me there on my solo adventures on the Art of War uh, Down Under. Very easy to find me there if you wish. Please get in, involved, join in. Part two, usually we have a bit of a listener, listener discussion, listener sending questions and t- things and topics that are on the topic um, that we're reviewing, and we unpack their questions, talk about the things that we should talk about. In this one, we're also going to be writing some lists for Leviathan, the Leviathan supplement, talking about things that work and don't work, a bit of matchup tech. You know, what is this good into now? What is it bad into? Where do you need to worry? What do you need for matchups, some secondaries, et cetera, et cetera. But in part one, we're just going to be reviewing the juicy, juicy content and I'm going to throw it straight over to John to tell you a little bit more about the War Room. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Art of War War Room is a wonderful global community that you can join on our website, theartofwar40k.com. We have a host of fantastic coaches in there, you know, top level 40k players from myself, Richard Siegler, Brad Chester, our very own Alex McDougall, Nick Nadavati. The names go on and on. Uh, we've got tons of great coaches in there teaching you all kinds of things about high level 40k. Uh, we have clinics where we review various armies. We talk about, you know, all sorts of things like how to deploy the various missions. And mm-hmm. we have coaching games every week where we take top tier armies, put them against each other, and uh, really explore in depth the strategy that goes into high level 40K. It's a wonderful community that you can be a part of. And uh, yeah, you can check that out on our website. Fantastic. Now, Alex, could you tell us a little bit about coaching through the art of war? How long have you been doing it? Have you found it rewarding? Do you hate it? Et cetera, et cetera. Give, unpack it a little bit for the listeners. Uh, well, I really enjoy it. Um, I mean, I'm always one to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, the coaching has been going wonderfully. Uh, obviously, I've had a bunch of new clients show up with new Tyranid rules, as I've only ever teached or coached Tyranids. Mm-hmm. Um, I will obviously do anything else as well, but that you know, that's what I'm known for, is the Tyranid side of stuff. Um, I think it's been really rewarding um, on both sides. I've enjoyed doing it. I've enjoyed meeting new people. And it's been fun to just kind of articulate ideas to somebody eager to learn. Mm. Fantastic, man. Fantastic. All right, gentlemen, they can, go, everyone can go over to the Art of War 40K and find out more about all the things we just talked about, can't they? Absolutely. Yeah, we've got everything on the website. Um, you know, we, we saw all kinds of things here. Obviously, um, you can get, you know, premium coaching with uh, as wonderful people as Alex or myself if you're interested in, a, you know, maybe developing your own hive mind. Um, as well, you can <laughs> get like one-off army lists, coaching calls, whatever you want. We've got it on our website. Exactly right. All right, gentlemen, jumping into this review. So those at home, we're going to be starting off on page 88 of the Codex Leviathan supplement. Now, first and foremost, I'd like to jump over to Alex because you've been, you are the diehard, dedicated, you know, um, hive mind player. John's uh, is a filthy meta chaser to all intents and purposes, but he has his true loves, you know. <laughs> um, where was Nids, pri- where were Nids at prior to this book? 
I think if you were playing um, Forces of the Hive Mind, where you had that little bit of GSC tech, I would put them kind of like um, middle, lower of the pack. They were not mm. suffering like pure GSC or Tau or Imperial Guard, but they were definitely not, um, you know, ruining anyone's days. Yeah, it's more like that. It's like they had one or two very. It seems like they almost felt like they were ne- where Necrons were last edition. They had one or two very good things that they could take, and then everything else had to support or protect those one or two very good things and let them work. And if that, if you could maintain that whilst you know scoring points and roadblocking your opponent, you could do a good job. Is that, is that about right, John? Yeah, honestly, um, I, I would say Tyranids were like a B minus if we were to grade them, where they were very noticeably below some ninth edition rules, but they, they had some good tools. They had some good tech. There was room for a creative player, especially one who was well-practiced such as Alex to uh, do good things and still scrape out a mm. GT win. But um, frankly, getting a major or super major win felt like it was reserved for the, uh, the non tier mid armies in the game. That's fair. I mean, I feel exactly the same way about guard as well. I feel like I could, you know, a best, best guard player in the world could, you know, get a comfortable four, four and one, but the five and oh is just so, so very elusive. Now, I love that I was able to call John a filthy meta chaser. He didn't even blink, guys. Didn't even, like, hasn't, hasn't, you know, not a single bead of sweat. He's just like, yeah, whatever. I love it. Didn't even rise to the bait. And in, in true fashion, I guess I'm just going to hand pass it to him. Tell us about the first of these Warlord traits. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the Warlord traits for High Fleet Leviathan are wonderful. They've got three of them here. Uh, the first one is Swarm Leader. Um, it theoretically has a name other than Chapter Master, but I'll read it to you. In your <laughs> command phase, select one friendly Leviathan infantry, beast, or swarm unit uh, within nine inches of this Warlord until the end of your of your next command phase. Each time model in that unit makes an attack, you can reroll the hit roll. As Nids have never had this, have they? Not even in combat. Like they've never had, never had full rerolls. Yeah. It's really hard to get full rerolls with Tyranids. There were very, very limited access, but normally mm-hmm. it was like rerolling ones, a demon yeah. time reroll sets, but you, you really didn't have any kind of rerolls with Tyranids. It was one of their mm. biggest weaknesses, in my opinion. Um, Alex, what do you think about this? Is this just like, because I look at this, I'm like, well, that's just like an auto take, right? That's <laughs> just, oh, yeah, just absolutely. You in the face. And in addition Damn. to that, the stuff that we have, like so many of the things that we have just have such an absurd volume of attacks that mm. like if you can make them re-roll, it's like, like 80, 80 gene stealer attacks, 90 devil gaunt attacks. Yeah. We have a lot of stuff that doesn't have good ballistic skill either. So the rerolls mm. really bail us out there. But we have a lot yeah. of like weapon skill, ballistic skill four. I was about to say the 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 different there's a big gap between the good shooting units and the bad shooting units in Tyranids, isn't there? Yeah. Um, all right, jumping down to the next one, which I will do, strategic adaptation. After where players have deployed their armies, but before the first battle round begins, set up two, up to two Leviathan units that are your army that are in your your deployment zone and redeploy them. You cannot select this warlord if the mission uses strategic reserve rules. Of course, blah blah blah. Any of those can be placed in strategic reserve without having to pay an additional CP, regardless of how many units are already in strategic reserve. If both players do this, you roll off whoever goes first. Blah blah. This seems extremely good as well. <laughs> and something that I think Tyranids almost should have been the primogenitor of this kind of redeploy thing. It seems like something like them or GSC would always, you know, have been able to do. And yet this is kind of the first time we've seen it for Niz, right? Yeah, there was a Warlord trait that let the Warlord specifically redeploy, but you couldn't hmm. pick any other units. So it was very limited. Uh, this is certainly a first. I really don't understand why this says, except this Warlord. Most of them say this Warlord... Is must be part of it. Like you must redeploy this warlord and up to like the deceiver, like uh, the um, the one for custodies, like the bearer and another unit can get redeployed. Alex, is this a bit of a head scratcher or is this just amazingly good? And I should stop reading between the lines. Um, no, nah, this is awesome. I, th- I mean, the fact that it can't be the warlord, like I don't really care. Um, the way mm. you're going to be building most of your turned list right now, the warlord is going to have like basically everything attached to it, and you yep. never want him ever poking his head out because he's got rerolls, a synaptic link. The relic that's re- get, regaining yep. uh, CP, like he he just can't die. <laughs> so, if, well, it's the guy you just read out seems very much like. I mean, you guys remember the Imperial Fists um, Lieutenant or Captain people used to have? That was, you know, Chapter Master and Lieutenant and giving out cover and all this stuff. And he was just just a buff monster, but you'd never give him any gear. Is that kind of what you guys are talking about, John? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Mm. I, I think that's going to be very you know very common. You're you're going to see a lot of stuff later on in this review that really helps build that kind of a buff monster. But yep. uh, given that some of the Tyranid HQs or characters in general already are a little bit lacking in teeth, this is just going to mm. build even more into that where you don't try to give them teeth and there's a lot well, of that, good buffs to be had. 
that's absolutely a thing, isn't it? Like Tyranids, they used to feel like a merely powerhouse, and that's only kind of declined. But there's, you know, a lot of life has been, I think, blow like breathed back into that in this in this um, supplement. Um, Alex, you want to talk? Tell us about this last one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is Gestalt something. I don't have the book open. So I just Alt Commander. Yeah. Just Alt Commander. Probably yeah. Have it <laughs> so this one here is, at the start of each battle round, select one Warlord trait from the High Fleet of Warlord traits out of Codex Tyranids for this Warlord. You aren't allowed to select the Leviathan one for some reason, but whatever. Um, until the end of the battle round, the Warlord has the selected Warlord trait and replaces all instances of the High Fleet key. Well, yeah, that's just to mean that you can still hand this out to Leviathan units, even though the mm. keywords will still say, like, for Kraken or for uh, Gorgon or whatever. Yeah, so so you can only pick the High Fleet-specific wall of traits, or is this any from the, the Codex? Uh, any from Codex Tyranids. Beautiful. Is this any good, John? I think this is fantastic. I, I actually I think that it is just the High Fleet wall of traits. Mm. Um because there's like high fleet whirler traits and like high mind whirler traits. Yeah. So I think this is just pick the specific high fleet ones. Oh, yeah. Okay. But uh, it's it's still very very strong. We've been kind of affectionately calling this the Pokeball because <laughs> you get to uh, you get to choose a new warlord trait uh, every yeah. battle round essentially. Um, and so, there's a couple in there that are very situationally good, and mm-hmm. then if, then there's like one that's just generically useful because you get to pick like the Leviathan or the Hydra or not Leviathan, but you get to pick the Hydra, or the Gorgon, or the Kraken whirler trait mm. and there's a couple in there that are just pretty good to have. Um, could you give us a breakdown? Like, what's give us a good example? Like, what's a situation where this would come up, and then what would you what would you switch into? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think the best standard one is the Yormungandr trait, which is every unit within three inches of this warlord ignores cover. Yeah, well, okay. So generically <laughs> useful. Uh, it's stuck yeah. on Yormungandr normally, but mm-hmm. uh, if you can take in Leviathan, it, it certainly has play. Um, High Fleet Kraken picks a unit and makes it fight first. High Fleet That's Kronos, nice. I believe. Yep gives an aura where if your opponent fails a psychic power within 18 inches of the warlord, they they take D3 mortal wounds, which is completely garbage into Adamek. So you never want that on your list. <laughs> yeah, it's spot on. But, uh, well, exactly you know, right. If you found yourself against Thousand Suns, right? Yeah, or, or, or uh, you know, GKs or whatever. You're already giving out, um, you know, minus one from Shadows in the Warp. So yeah, this is, uh, that's good. Those are three, I got to put out the word premium warlord traits because there's no crap option there. I, th- I don't think you can go wrong, right? Yeah, I, I think I would, if I could, I think I would take all three of these Warlord traits every single yeah. time. Phenomenal. Um, J- Alex, what do you think about these Warlord traits? Um, oh, yeah, as a general thing, yeah, I think these are all, like, the best Warlord traits that you kind of have in the game right now. Like, a full mm. reroll, a redeploy, it's just, like, all of money. Um, I'm not quite as sold on the third one as John is, but not mm-hmm. that I think it's bad. I just think it's outshone by the other two. Um if the option was like, hey, you can buy two Warlord traits, but there's only these two, like there wasn't redeploy, I would still pay mm. this extra CP to grab full rerolls and pick an extra Warlord trait for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I actually think they're, they're all phenomenal. And for all for different reasons, I think Nids, more than a lot of armies, get mileage from the redeploy. Like, you, uh, uh, let me t- tell me if I'm wrong, John. I feel like Nids is one of those armies, like Guard. Is, I keep coming back to Guard as well. That are just really, really vulnerable to an Alpha Strike, like f- more than most. Yeah, I mean, Tyranids are you know generically pretty fragile. Um, of course, you know they're bugs. They don't uh, have as much power armor as the rest of us. Uh, there's not as many invulns in a typical tier mm. list as some other armies get. Um, obviously, it is an Eighth Edition book, so their defensive profiles are early, early Eighth Edition standards of tough. It's hard, you know. Yep. There's no just universal minus one damage a, a lot of those factors are missing so yeah tyranids are relatively squishy mm. uh so anything to help mitigate that is just fantastic here agreed all right over to the relics now <laughs> uh, alex the relics has never not been the strong place it's not been the place to find power traditionally in the tyranid book yeah i think when it came out the tyranid codex was like you could almost stick the pages together with the relic section and you wouldn't even notice yeah yeah the relics were almost universally um bad or like silly like it was one mm-hmm. of the i think it was codex that was early enough that honestly i just don't think gw really knew what to do with relics yet mm-hmm. they were like oh let's take a weapon and make it like slightly better or yeah. let's have, like, it'll affect, like, one statistic, and it just didn't really matter. And then now some mm. of the relics are like, yeah, this gun is damage four with eight shots. You're like, <laughs> yes. oh, okay. <laughs> it replaces your pistol that used to be strength four if you want. <laughs> well, yeah, well, now, there's a shame. There's no, there's no relic pistol here. Like, a relic pistol for Niz would have been hilarious, such a trope. But jumping in, we, the first one is uh, Biomorphic Carapace. 
And this is straight up and simple. Each time the attack is made against the bearer, subtract one from the attack's wound roll. And I think this is amazing. <laughs> but tell me I'm wrong. Um, oh, you know, I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. <laughs> I don't. I don't oh. think you're wrong. Um, if or this, will, I guess, will probably come up more in um, the second half of the episode. But I'm not sure that what you want to have minus one on, which I assume in like 90 percent of cases would be a hive tyrant. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if he fits the usual build. Um, yep. It, it's more like, is the thing good? Just rules on the page. Yes, very much so. Is it good specifically as a meta decision? Maybe not. That's fair. Yeah, that that is a fair point. It's something people should always keep in mind um, when deciding if a unit's worth taking or not. Um, John, what do you think? Uh, I think it's a fantastic relic. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of good ones in here, so I'm not going to promise that this one fits in a list. But also, mm. if you ever put it in a list, you're not just making a mistake. This is a great relic. Um, it's really just a question of do you have the characters to put it on? But this is a great problem for Tyranids because previously it was honestly I would rather have a command point than my free relic. Mm-hmm. And now it's a question of I actually am willing to consider buying an additional relic. Um, yeah. Because mm-hmm. Tyranids just didn't have that kind of a situation before. So it, it, it's really nice to have this. Um, I, I think Alex is right. The best take here is on a Hive Tyrant. Just taking a relatively high toughness model, making them harder to wound, mm-hmm. increased durability is great. You know, Tyranids are historically fragile. Any way to get durability into the book is going to be appreciated. Is it necessary in a top tier list? Maybe. I've been playing with it. It's good. I don't know if it's uh, going to stick mm-hmm. or not, but uh, we'll talk all about that in part two. Yeah, I think, if, I think if you were going to take a Hive Tyrant, you're like, yeah, my build will include a Hive Tyrant. I definitely think at that point, you would almost be silly to not take this because mm. T7, four plus a vulnerable save, minus one to wound, Catalyst is super hard to move. Yes, extremely, extremely hard to move. I was even thinking of crazy crap like uh, Turvagons and stuff because as soon as you hit that toughness eight, well, it, it, they are tough to say on Turvagons, yeah? Yeah, as soon as you toughness eight minus one to wound, there's nothing equivalent to that in the game. There's like that's that is like a having a three plus invulnerable save almost for how crazy that can that can get on the metrics. I mean, <clears throat> we, we talk about the people having issues with things like uh, speedwire, and that guy kind of just laughs at speedwire. Um, the only issue is stuff like the Dacker Jets still just do so much. Um, all right, jumping down to the Void Crown, who wants to take it? Somebody jump in. I'd love to. I'll take the Void Crown. So uh, the Void Crown is for a Psyker model only. Uh, the bearer knows one additional power from the Hive Mind Discipline in Codex Ternans. And then if the bearer <laughs> attempts to use a Psychic p- action in your Psychic phase, it can still manifest one Psychic power during that phase. And then each time a Psychic uh, test is made for the bearer, an unmodified 9+, plus, that Psychic mm. power or action cannot be denied. So uh, generically useful, it's a very good Psychic mm. Relic. Yeah, I on paper that seems pretty good. I mean, I'm not sure how often it's going to come up. I'm hoping this this kind of alludes to ho- hopefully Nids getting a maybe a psychic secondary in their codex that would make this fit a little a little better. Because a lot of the, I mean, uh, the unkillable Lord of Change is the only thing I think I know of that gets the psychic secondaries pretty reliably. But uh, maybe you guys are seeing more here than I am. Alex, what do you think? Um, I think this absolutely is just a case of the psychic secondaries being so bad that this doesn't redeem mm-hmm. them. Um, is this a good overall general relic? Yeah, totally. Like only having to roll a nine and that's irresistible now. You can't stop that. Mm. Is like that's actually really good. Knowing an extra spell is kind of nice, even though it doesn't let you cast an extra spell. Um, this is not like Resonance Barb where you get to like cast a whole extra spell. Um, yep. It just comes down to I think the main reason you'd want to do this is to have a guy that can like go do. Um, I don't know whatever any of the relic or the psychic actions are, which I don't remember yep. the names of them because I've never picked them because they're, <laughs> they're so bad that they just are unplayable. Um, yeah. Which, again, this is not an issue with the relic. This is an issue with uh, psychic action game design. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the secondaries. Uh, John, is there more to this to meet the eye? Um, initially, no. I, I think that both of the first two relics, though, are kind of one of those cases where I'm probably not going to take it right now. But it's also yep. one of those things that's nice to have as a tool, and there's totally mm. a future list that may come back and slot slot this in. You know, maybe if in the next you know mission update some of the psychic secondaries get a little better, maybe Tyranids get a a codex supplement, a codex, and then they uh they get a psychic secondary. Anything like that could make the action part a little more appealing. Yeah. Right now I'm probably not going to use it much, but also you know just a a, a relic to know an extra power and then have mm. a little undeniable on a nine plus. That alone is pretty good. You know, like people will take the Spaceman Relic just to know an extra power. Yeah. 
This yep. is no an extra power, and you get a on a nine plus. It's undeniable. Well, I was about to say, if you're looking for a third of like your third relic, your third option for a relic, this isn't an awful one. If you've got a purpose for it, you're right. Yeah. It's not gonna it's not gonna change how your army plays or make any make you do anything particularly better. But you know, if it takes a, a psychic secondary that was absolutely trash and lets you get six points when you're struggling for a third pick. You know, so for a third pick relic and a third pick secondary, and if that makes it a little bit more palatable for you, maybe it's okay. Um, next up, we have synaptic hive blades model with bones, bone swords, and monstrous bone swords only. Each time the bear makes a melee attack with bone swords and monstrous bone swords, invulnerable saving throws cannot be made against that attack. I think that would be a lot better if Nids had better melee uh, numbers of melee attacks. You know, they just don't have enough attacks for me to think that. Making them better in melee is the is the the good way to go, but I'm I'm open to be told I'm wrong. I've never found apart from gene steals in combat, even swarm lord. I don't find that scary, but um, tell yeah. tell me I'm an idiot. This no no you're right. This uh this relic is absolutely just such a bait. It's such a trap. You're like oh, ignore mm. invulnerable saves. Oh man, if only the AP wasn't already garbage. <laughs> yeah yeah, it's AP well, two. It's AP so two. If you throw that at vanguard veterans. Cool, they still have a four plus. Yeah. <laughs> You've changed literally nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then to make it viable, uh, you would have to go and give it like murderous size. So now mm-hmm. you have uh, AP3. But even then, yep. it's like it's so situational to actually do something. And so you're I, killing I, like, I don't know, a succubus with it or something. Like, is that what you're how hunting? Many- how many attacks are you actually throwing here? Five, six? Uh, five with the tyrant because yeah. uh, the lash or the bone swords give you one extra attack. Well, if, if it's really it's because you're not allowed to have nice things. It's a good reason you've got five. They should have like seven, man, for what they're yeah. what they're supposed and to be. You also don't have any rerolls, so there's the people call it like the tyrant sickness, where you have like mm. your five attacks and inevitably you roll like two ones. <laughs> yeah, so exactly like, right. Yeah. Yeah, three hits through. You're only strength six because again, tyrants. Mm. Um, so you win like two, and then they make one of their invulns, and you didn't kill your commander anyway. Mm. Um, slap us in the face with some truth, John. Is this actually terrible? Yeah, this is actually pretty terrible. Um, it's fine. Again, if we get a new codex and monstrous bone swords get better, this becomes mm-hmm. a viable relic. So I'm, I'm not sad to have it. But if you look at right now, there's no way that this makes it in, especially yeah. when Tyranids have the old style of get an extra relic, where it's three command points to get an extra relic. Yes, that, yeah, Seems exactly very right. unlikely you're ever going more than two. Mm, spot on. Well, keep going, John. Tell us about the last one. All right. Well, uh, yeah, we saved the best for last. The adaptive neural lobe is the, uh, the last uh, relic for Leviathan. Quite simply, while the bear is on the battlefield, each time your opponent spends a command point to use a stratagem, you can roll one di- d6, and on a five plus, you gain one command point. So it's kind of like a better Karov Zaquila. I about to say, because this is better than some of the traditional ones where you get to you get to roll a 5-plus for every stratagem they use. So even if they use 3 CP, you only get to roll one five, one dice. If they use 3 CP, you get to roll 3 dice, right, for this? Exactly. So that that, that part is really, really good. So yeah, mm. you can roll 3 dice on a 3 CP stratagem. Um, we're obviously going to talk about stratagems relatively soon. Uh, this is very very good for tyrannids yeah i don't want to go out on a limb and like you know uh <laughs> shoot the lead or whatever but uh the the stratagems is looks to me now to be the best part of all of tyrannids is their yeah. their suite of stratagems so it, looks, it already was honestly i was about to say I, th- I think it was pretty close to already being there because god knows it's not the data sheets right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no it's really not <laughs> um alex you want to kick us off with the first of the strats Oh, do I? Uh, the first mm-hmm. they put the best one right in the beginning, like the very first one, because don't miss this one. It's this is the one. It is relentless fury. Uh, one CP. You have exploding sixes, and then it has a whole bunch of text behind it, which is that if you are t- uh, over ten models, then you have a double exploding sixes, and then if you are cheat stealers, it costs two CP. Which. As Colin Sherman pointed out, I love when a stratagem tells you who to apply it to. Yes, exactly right. They tell you this is why you should put it on these guys and why it should cost more. Yeah. Um, so they obviously, uh, somebody at G-Dub rolled it out and realized uh, this should cost more on G-Stealers because it's phenomenal. And they're absolutely right. This is super powered, right, John? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, Relentless Flurry is fantastic. So, you know, the things that I love is that you use a stratagem in your shooting phase or in your fight phase, and it's for any Leviathan unit. So... Of course, we're going to love yes. it on our weight of fire units, like uh, you know, like Gaunts or on Gene Stealers. But this can be any Leviathan unit. So for one CP late game, you can put it on the Swarm Lord. 
if you just really need to get mm-hmm. a little extra damage and it, it can go on anything. This is a fantastic strategy. I'm really, really happy that they put this one in for us. I, the fact that it's so open-ended, that in shooting phase or fight phase, any unit, any profile, any anything, just makes me think this is just one of the one best one CP strats in in the playbook. Like, to just sprinkle and if sprinkle a little bit of goodness on whatever you want. I love it. I think it's an, amazing. John, tell us about the next one. All right, next up is questing tendrils. This one's a little weird. Uh, use this strategy in your second movement phase when you set up a Leviathan unit from your army that has arrived from strategic reserves. Uh, you can set up that unit as if it was battle round three. So only on your second, and it's one command point. So yeah. on your yeah. second battle round, you traditionally arrive outside of your deployment's, opponent's deployment zone and more than six from their edge. And on the third battle round, you arrive more than six inches from their edge. So this looks like it's just one CP to get in their deployment zone with an outflanking unit Yeah, if, you, if your opponent hasn't screened it out. This is a little bit yep. of a weird one. Frankly, I think it's actually the the least uh, impactful in the in the supplement. But it's kind mm. of one of those things that I don't actually think I will use it ever in my life. I think the most likely thing is that I'll tell my opponent, like, hey, just so you know, I do have this yeah. strategy. Yep. But even then, if you have a lictor, you'll just spend a CP on that to completely ignore the uh, you know the downside. And since you're not going to play on your opponent completely failing to screen, you're going to take the lictor anyway. So. It just seems like another way to use a CP to deliver Gaunts when you already kind of have a good one. Yeah, that's fair. I I mean, it, the only time it would make sense is if your opponent, for some reason, makes the mistake of forgetting you have this, and it's like, oh, I don't need to screen you in turn two, I just need to screen you in turn three, and you get cheeky engage and rod. And that's pretty much the only real application yeah. I see, right? But even then, I think it's just um, going to be my opponent not screening on turn two, and we'd be like, hey, just so you know, and then they have to screen, and I just get to kill the unit. Like, I'm never going to actually yeah. use it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Spot on. Um, I'm assuming there's nothing more to be said there, Alex. Uh, yeah, I think you actually brought up the only interesting part, which is like every once in a while you start realizing that maybe you're running out of uh, uh, resources, and you're like, "Man, I really, I don't want to use Pheromone Trail because I really need that lector to do Rod." Mm. But that is so niche. Like, I don't think it would come up in I don't know, yeah. 99 percent of your games. Fair enough. Um, next up is. 1 CP for Alpha Leader Beast. Use this strategy before the battle when you are mustering your army. After nominating a Leviathan character model that is not a named character to be your Warlord, you generate one additional Warlord traits for them uh, from the Leviathan Warlord traits table. Each Warlord trait must be unique, blah, blah, blah. So pretty much everybody's getting something like this. I mean, I've got it just for Black Templars. Um, this seems like it's actually going to be good for this army now because you have such good freaking Warlord traits, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is just an auto-include. Um, I think every single time you're going to take... Uh, j- uh, Full rerolls and something, and mm-hmm. yeah, just toss it onto one character, and then one CP you get redeploy or pokeball or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't see this ever not being used in a game. And that, exactly what you guys said before about this this uh, HQ buff monster that just kind of throws out just a bunch of really impactful bits and pieces. Um, Alex, continue. Tell us about the next one. Okay, the next one is animated by the hive mind this is one of my favorites pick a leviathan monster when it is destroyed if it has the ability to explode on death uh, death throws you don't roll he just blows up cool are there any super exploding monsters i mean i know that is it the the toxicrine is super explosion or is it the maliceptor uh i believe it's the toxicrine and then there is also the barbteridol barbteridol is just explode Ooh. flat three Ooh, yeah. and that's yeah. not bad. That's a big base. That's a real big base. <laughs> yes, if you can pull that off and get it in somebody's face, which could happen, you could have a, a low um, health, not particularly useful barb tier duel, and you could yep. just swarm lord it into something and make it go die, and then have that <laughs> grenade in someone's lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty fun, John. Is this is this sick? Is this cool? Yeah, super useful. It, it's obviously very situational. But I like having a couple of situational strats because you know I can't afford to use every strat in here in every game. But um, mm. when this comes up, you know, when a one wound succubus kills your hive tyrant, when you have a wounded three wound mon- you know, monster that explodes for flat three and you want to throw it at knob. Fun fact that I'm probably not going to use soon: the Harris Vex also explodes for flat three. Um, Ooh, that's I don't cool. Plan to take one anyways, but hey, if the Harris Specs ever got a little cheaper in chapter approved, this would be a great excuse to throw him in the list and just you know eat him forward. Um, it just makes mm. dealing with some of your prickly monsters a little bit harder. Um, I love auto explode strats. Most Tyranid monsters only explode three inches, whereas uh, a lot of vehicles right now explode six. Um, six, yeah. Uh, even with it being smaller, it's still deadly. And uh, just taking a couple wounds off someone with you when you need it and when you know you need mortals, it's just great value to have in your pocket. Um, are you, 
Do spore mines hurt yourself? Like, can you run into your own spore mines? Uh, no, no, spore mines are not. Okay, cool. Not cool, cool, cool. I was, I was trying to figure out a way you could, you could uh, jank this, blow yourself up on your terms, and <laughs> in a premium position where your opponent can't run away from it. <laughs> but you know, here we are. We're grasping for straws. Um, next up is synaptic domination, one CP. You just stratagem in your psychic face. Select one friendly leviathan synapse unit from your army. Then select one friendly leviathan non synapse unit from your army. And so starting next psychic phase, while synapse unit is on the battlefield, and that non-synapse unit always counts as being within range of synapse for the purposes of synapse and extinctive behaviors. How many times did they have synapse written in that in that sentence, in that paragraph? We've got one in the name, two, three, four, five, six. I think there's seven instances of synapse in that synapse-based it, strategy. It's enough to point out that the synapse wording and ruling is uh, really bad and should be changed. <laughs> yes, it's fair, it's fair. John, is this any good? Um, it's fine. It's one CP, so... It's a very situational strat, but if you're going to have a situational strat, you want it to be cheap. Um, it, I don't think it's going to come up often. Um, there are more buffs for being in synapse range than there were before, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, so this does have some value. It's also kind of like a 1CP preemptive auto pass, if you want to think of it that way, mm -hmm. where if you know you're going to throw forward a 30-man Hormigant squad to go touch a bunch of objectives and move block, and you know you're going to do some cool casualty pulling tricks, and you know that you're going to leave synapse range. It's not a bad idea to put this out. You know, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll therefore be in the synapse range in your next command phase. You'll be in it during morale when it comes for leadership. It's not terrible, um, but situational. So think of when you'll need it. Uh, you're probably not going to use it often, but hey, it's nice to have every once in a while. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. Um, Alex, you want to take the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Keep shutting the book like a dummy. Um, <laughs> the, control the swarm. Yeah, control the swarm. If the stratagem, or use the stratagem, if you will from a warlord, right, this is if you lose a warlord, you can now pick another Leviathan synapse creature and make it your warlord. Um, cool. Kind of yeah. useful. Yeah. You don't get to pick the same warlord trait, um, which is pretty unfortunate. Mm. This must be a warlord trait that the model you just, I'm uh, sorry, model from your army that does not have a warlord trait, then select a warlord trait that no model in your army has. Um, mm. I assume on timing that means the one that's dying is still technically on the board. So you can't take chapter commander rerolls again. Yeah. Well, it says when when is it is destroyed. So of destroyed to is there a different if there's a different timing on destroyed and removed from the table, or is it the same thing? Um, I think it's the John, same what do you thing. Think? I think the real question from a, yeah. a you know a loot rules lawyer perspective is is a dead model still part of your army? Because I I kind of feel like it is. So yeah, like you're I'd not going to gain is. combat doctrines mid game just because your loyal thirty two all died. Um, yeah, that's fair. So I, I think this is just we have two good warlord traits, and if your warlord ever dies, you go ahead and reread the third one and see if it's something that will help right now. That's a great. That's a great point. That is a very good way of of looking at that. Um, mm -hmm. John, you want to keep going? Tell us about the last one. On 100%, this page. So hive mind imperative is one command point. Uh, use a stratagem in your command phase. Select one leviathan unit from your army that is within twelve inches of a synapse unit until the start of your next command phase. Uh, the unit you selected gains the objective secured ability. And if a model in that unit already oh, has no. this ability, it counts as one additional model when determining control of an objective marker. And then if the unit you selected performs an action, it can shoot without that action failing. So one CP, why didn't I, and it doubles up on why didn't I know about action and shoot oh. without the action failing and gives you obsec in your command phase, which is obviously the best time to have it. Why didn't I know about the strategy? Why? <laughs> I must have read this and forgot about this. Holy crap, this is amazing. Oh yeah, this is one of the best things in the book. This is I, I obviously Relentless Flurry is one that we're using a lot. I have already mm. used this tragedy a ton. It's a fantastic value. So for those for people who are unaware or have forgotten what the Tyrionid Codex has, it is one of the last bastions of the double activations. Of the double moves, double fights, double double shoots. And the fact that at the start of your command phase, you can look at a unit of 30 Gaunts or 30 Hormigans, give it double obsec, and then yeet it and pull down all your opponent's banners or stop them putting all their banners up, turn one, seems good to me. That seems very spicy. Um just to, you can just pick a turn and just destroy their primary score. Give them a donut whenever you, whenever you really feel like it, because you have such dynamics still in the book. And of course, all that that unit is so dead, like as dead as all dead. But it doesn't matter; it's doing the damage. Alex, this seems almost like you almost want to take a unit or two to make sure you can wreck your opponent's primary with this, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is um, a primary reason why a lot of the tournament players right now are looking at uh, sky saucer swarms or raveners. Mm -hmm. There's something really, really fast that you can go, oh, okay, that's got objective secured now. Uh, Swarm Lord, or with the other stratagem... Uh, Metabolic to, Override. Yeah, to just double move. 
just go, mm-hmm. hey, I was 30 inches away. Well, guess what? That's not your objective anymore. Yeah, I think this is uh, phenomenal. And yeah, absolutely. Look at people at home, it, it, pull out your gargoyles. I don't know, find your little bits and pieces that'll make this go because this is good. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, real good. All right, next one up. Hyper Adaptation 2CP. Use a stratagem in your command phase. Select one Leviathan unit from your army, then select one High Fleet Adaptation. Until the end of the turn, models in that unit have the selected High Fleet Adaptation instead of the Synaptic Imperative High Fleet Adaptation. So they, they lose Leviathan and they gain something of your choice. Is that correct? Yep, pretty much. So just you, you lose the, uh, the Leviathan Inherent Rule, their chapter tactic, and just pick a new one. Mm-hmm. Um, give us a give us an example of how someone would use this, John. Um, quite frankly, I, I think that is, might as well be rebranded as a, go ahead and be Kraken for a turn. You become Kraken. You become Kraken for yeah. a turn. Yeah. Um, so the big thing oh, here is did that, you need to emergency fall back from combat? Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's an emergency fall back in charge. Um, there are a couple of other high fleet buffs. You can also pick one of the um the the custom ones, the custom adaptations, which were reprinted here, but are the same as Blood of Ball. Um. So mm-hmm. you can, you know, get an emergency piece of AP on Scything Talons if that's just what you need more than anything else right now. But what, what really it's been for me so far is when I need a good advance roll, I spend 2 CP, take a unit, and turn it into High Fleet Kraken so that I've got the 3d6 take the highest and that I can potentially CP roll all 3d6 if I need it. So, like, if I need a yeah, 4 wow. plus on an advance roll and I'm not willing to, you know, just use a 4-up, you know, and have a CP re-roll, then this is a fantastic strategy. I think yeah, this is a clutch. Uh, yeah, I need to I need to pull something out to win the game. Yeah, um, big play. I love it. I think it's really good. Alex, you're up next. Uh, avoid in the warp. Use the stratagem in your opponent's psychic phase after a psychic test is passed from an enemy psychic unit, and after any deny the witch attempt is made. If that enemy psychic unit is within 24 inches of any Leviathan synapse units from your army, roll a d6 on a four plus. That psychic power is denied. Um, who needs who needs Kronos, right? Yeah, I mean, a 4-plus after all is said and done is nice, especially since it is probably only ever going to get sprung on the really, really important unit. Um, The fact that it's from a Leviathan Synapse specific is a little odd. Um, Most of the Synapse creatures are Psychers anyway, um, but might not be the case. But yeah, just an extra 4-plus to be like, no, war time Mm. fails, get out of here. Yeah. Yep, seems good, right? Is there much more to say, John? No, I think I think it's good value. Again, situational. Again, one CP. That's the best cost for situational strat. You're not going to use it often, but when you have it, mm. it's a very good thing to tell your opponent about. Same as Black Templars, right? You don't actually use it that often, but now your opponent has to be like, ooh, man, they have a deny and a minus one to cast and maybe a four plus. Now I really have to keep my psychers way back, and then they're not denying you, and you're just kind of bullying mm. the board position at that point because you make your opponent's psychers be extra, extra careful, or accept that they're not game planning on any any spells. Exactly right. Well, John, bring us home. What's the last All one? All right, the last one is Bioadapted Borer Grubs, uh, which is one or two command points, depending on what you targeted on. Uh, use a stratum in your shooting phase when the Leviathan unit from your army is selected to shoot. Basically, each time a model in that unit makes an attack with a Flesh Borer or a Flesh Borer Hive, on an unmodified wound roll of six, the attack inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to normal damage to a maximum of six mortal wounds per phase. And then if that unit is a Tyrant effects, it costs two CP. Otherwise, it costs one. Uh, so basically, um, oh, and you yep. cannot use this stratagem and Scorch Bugs at the same time. Uh, Scorch Bugs is one CP plus one to wound with Devour, with, um, not Devour, mm. with um, Flesh Bores in the tier. Flesh Bores. This is fine, but for clarity for everyone at home, the Flesh Bore is the generic gun that comes on the Termagant and the Gargoyle, and I don't believe is available anywhere else. It's 12 inches, mm-hmm. strength 4, assault 1, AP dash, damage 1. It's basically yep. the bolt pistol that your guns are pistol. with. Yeah, and it's actually really hard. Well, so breaking it down for people, how many gaunts do you need within 12 inches to effectively get? Do you need? Is it 36 gaunts? Uh, I mean, to- it's max 30 gaunts in a unit. So if you have 30 exactly. gaunts that are hitting on 4s, you so get that's what I was trying to say. I was trying to say it's, get, it's on average, 2.5 mortal wounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So you'd need to have a doubling and tripling down effects. So you need to have some kind of rerolls to wound, which I think you can get. You can get real ones and twos from a synaptic link we'll talk about in a moment. Yeah, you can and you can also hide you can also Turbagon. Yeah. And you can also, of course, um do the new chapter master on it, which means you're not chapter mastering Hive Guard, Exocrine, yeah, anything sure. else. But even if you do do that, do you still get the six mortal wounds? No. Like you're hitting on fours, re-rolling. Like you don't anyway, do you? No, yeah. The, the the cap of six mortals is there for hot dice and consistency, frankly, because they put it on mm-hmm. Wrath of Mars and they probably just don't want to think about it the next time they 
change flesh bores or whatever. They don't want to think about us accidentally finding a way. But right now, yeah. it's very... I, I see this as the last unit to shoot is 10 Termagants with flesh bores, and my opponent has a one wound character. Exactly. That, that's about, I was about to say, because that's exactly how it is for, I think, a, a lot of us out there who don't have the Super Mars strat and things like yeah. that. Um, uh, Alex, anything more to this than meets the eye? No, I don't think so. Um, I think mm. it's another one of those ones where it's a trap based on the words. People will look at that and go, wow, six mortal wounds. And then yeah. they'll think like, wait, can I even get that? Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah, we look. You look at the Dominion strat. You look at Wrath of Mars, and you're like, yeah, these guys just get six mortal wounds because they have a beautifully applicable unit, and it's an easy trigger. And there's the people think, ah, oh, but these things aren't like the others. This is a like exactly what John said. I, the thing you tried to kill didn't quite die. It's got one or two models left, and you've got a couple of couple of gaunts in range. You just go for it with the one CP. See if you get it. I, I can't. Can, can you ever see somebody taking a Tyrann effects for this strat with like the? Because I can't no, with the no, hives. No. Um, I yeah. can see people taking it. I can't see people being successful with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a truth bomb if there ever was one yeah the fact that it's two cp is mind-boggling actually because like Mm. it's one cp for a max of six mortal wounds on uh on the flat on the termagants why does it matter who's doing it if it's a cat of six mortal it's the same it's the same six mortal wounds it's not like he does 10 now for two cp that would be cool but no it's it's just i don't know why it costs more yeah it's the same it has the same cap i don't know why it costs more here Mm. it's just kind of a weird exactly right because like a and, you know, it's not like you're more likely to roll sixes on a Tyrant effects. They don't actually Termagants are better at that because they inherently rear ones to wound in a large unit. Spot on, spot yeah. on. Yeah, a little weird. It's a fine strat, but you're not going to use it much. All right, so that wraps up the stratagems, which I think are generally pretty good, right? And they're giving a bunch of stuff I don't think Nids had before, especially the Obsec one. Just seems incredible in my mind. Yeah, it, it, this is this is certainly a nice buff. You know, Tyrannids had very good stratagems before. Uh, but getting more damage output and a couple of tricks, uh, that, that's great. You know, a couple of really useful stratagems. Again, we have CP regeneration for the first time. Uh, all, all around, I think it's just a very solid increase for Tyranids, uh, especially in the stratagem yeah. department is where it's going to be. You're definitely going to feel it there. Yeah, exactly right. Alex, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, no, I'm I'm thrilled to have this. Even if the entire book, as far as stratagems was concerned, was just Obsec and Relentless Fury, I'd be happy. <laughs> There is like so much other gravy in here and things that are going to come up in certain games and bail you out. Fair enough. So we are over to the Hive Mind Synaptic Links, gentlemen. Now, this is gonna might take a little bit of explaining. I'm going to lean on you guys pretty heavily to get it out in a concise fashion. But, John, do you want to take us away? Take Tell us about these abilities. How do they work? And, uh, yeah, what's what's kind of the ins and outs? Yeah, absolutely. So Synaptic Links, are uh, they're quite complicated. Basically, you have a pregame upgrade similar to Master of the Forge, Chief Librarian, etc., that you can buy for the Synapse creatures in the Codex. And those are all command phase buffs that you apply to a unit Mm -hmm. in your Synapse range. So none of them have a a separate range based on their own thing. It's all in Synapse range. So that's obviously already a lot better. Some of these buffs are quite good. We'll talk about the individual links in a moment. But there is a little bit more, and there's even uh, several diagrams to explain this. Uh, quite simply, let's say your Tyranid Warriors have a synaptic link. They can put a buff on a unit in synapse range now. So if there's Hormagants within 12 inches of Tyranid Warriors, that's the standard synapse range, they can get the command phase buff. But you can yep. kind of sell tower your synapse creatures now, which for the record, I think is the fluffiest mechanic Games Workshop has put in. And it's actually good as well. Mm. It's very, very useful. So now let's say that your Tyranid Warriors are in synapse range so within 12 inches of a Hive Tyrant, who's also a synapse creature. The Warriors can put their buff on the Hive Tyrant if they want, or they can now put it on anything in the synapse range of that Hive Tyrant. So they can kind of take their orders, put it through the synapse web to the Hive Tyrant, and then the Hive Tyrant passes it on to the next unit. So if the Tyranid Warriors have the synaptic link, they pass it through the Hive Tyrant onto the Hormigons that are 23 inches away. And now they get the command phase buff. As long as you have an unbroken Mm. chain of synapse, you can go through as many synapse creatures as you want. You just need an unbroken synapse change from the unit giving the buff to the yep. unit receiving the buff. It's almost like they Chinese whispers the buff over, don't they? Exactly. It's like, <laughs> you're going to bring all hits. Pass it on. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're just giving <laughs> telephone down the line. Um, you can yeah, have up to hilarious. three synaptic links in a strike force game, which is the standard 2000 point, and they're all points upgrades, not command points. So I'm not going to be shocked if you end up seeing three in quite a few lists. 
Well, so far, the ones that I've seen people talking about is three in almost every list. But um, they're very interesting because they're all attached to a, a specific unit. So we have one for Broodlord, Hive Tyrant, Maliceptor, Neurothrope, Turvagon, Trigon Prime, Tyranid Prime, Tyranid Warriors, and Zoanthropes. A couple of those, I, I look at those names and I'm like, these buffs better be good to make me want to take a Trigon Prime, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, but gentlemen, you want to... Uh, sorry. Alex, is there any more to explain here that we've missed? Uh, I don't believe so. That is, that is most certainly the mechanics of it. The only frustrating thing I'll say about G Dub's layout is the whole you got you got the hive the synaptic links there, and then you have the diagrams, and then you have to go over the page to get the actual link. So I can't. I have to flick back a page to see uh, that one is for that guy and that one is for that guy. But luckily, they've at least put the names of the ones on there, just not the points costs. But um, Alex, you want to take us away and tell us about the first one, the one for the broodlords? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Master of Shadows or Master of Deception, I believe it's called, and it is to anything except a monster, hand out every type of cover that's light, dense, and heavy. And if it's mm-hmm. a monster, you get light and dense. Um, this one is again on paper, looks really good, but I still yep. think it's a bit of a trap. Um, because it is command phase, which means mm. it is no defense against the alpha strike, which really is where a defensive buff is most important. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's very true. And then on top of that, well, you know, Admec don't care about cover a lot of the time. They either just shoot, well, and same as speed while they either shoot through it or ignore it. Um, so yeah, this 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 does look it's pretty freaking good though. John, what are your thoughts? John? Yeah, sorry, I'm John, you there? And started slamming doors. Um, so you left to come. <laughs> All right. Um, so next up is Malicious Direction from the Hive Tyrant, and uh, that one is uh, that one's pretty interesting. Basically, you just pick a unit. And each time a model in this unit makes a pylon move, it can move up to an additional three inches to a max of six. So it's only pylon, not consolidate, um, mm-hmm. which means this is not bad, but I, I don't think it's ever going to crack anyone's top three, if I'm being honest. Mm. And fair enough. And so before I jump, get too far ahead, every single one of these buffs is 15 or 10 points. In fact, there's only one 10 pointer. The zone throw is the only one that's 10 points. Every, apart from that, every single one is 15. So thanks, J Dub, for making my review a little bit easier. Um, yeah, I, I agree. The, the pilot move additional three for 15 points on a hive tyrant he's not good enough to be worth worth charging more than a couple times a game so what you're going to use this pay 15 points to get one or two turns out of this at best at least that's how i'm seeing yeah. it. i didn't say this is worth it right yeah yeah i mean I'm, i might think about 15 points for this it's just once they tell me i have a cap of three and i read the rest of the page mm. they, there's just no universe where this cracks my top three ever yeah which is unfortunate because um, like the and, hive tyrant was already a synapse creature that was probably in the list now it's like hmm, mm. do i need another synapse creature Exactly right. Um, all right. Alex, tell us about the next one. Next one we have is... Let's flip my page two a couple times here. Because I knew the first one off by heart. <laughs> <'Cause it's, laughs> well done. It was the, uh, the one they initially previewed. Uh, mm, next one is good. probably one of my favorites. Um, this is on the Malice Scepter, Focal Essence. Each time a model in this unit makes an attack, uh, an unmodified wound roll of six has extra armor penetration, and you can reroll the damage. Um, I feel like those should be two separate things because putting them together is amazing. On the uh, same I am dot point. thrilled about it because it means that it has some versatility. It's not just being used for multi-damage weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. This might look like it has a lot of uses. It really only has two. <laughs> um, it's going to go on your Devourer Gods when you need to dig for some level of AP, and it's going to go on your Hive Guard to make them disgusting. Yep. Um, I just think this is phenomenal, and um, I mean, like, it's not a Malisaptor isn't a cheap prospect to to bring this buff, but I hear some people are doing it. John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, my thoughts are that I'm actually painting a Malisaptor while we're recording this podcast. <laughs> um, what you know, it, it is very obvious to put it on specifically those two units. You know, uh, Devourers, mm. which are a ton of way to fire. They like AP, and then of course, uh, Hive Guard. You know, it's just generally nice to have anything anything with reroll damage. Uh, I will also point out, though, that this is, each time this model makes an attack, it's not a ranged attack, it's not a combat attack, it's make an attack. So sure. while this is definitely going to be best on your hive guard, maybe you reach a point in your game where you are just shooting at demonettes. And you know what? Maybe you really want reroll damage on the scything talons or the monstrous rending claws of a broodlord or, or on anything else. Um, so it, it's cool that it works in combat. Maybe you can take another melee unit like Cormagants and give them the extra AP on, on sixes. Um, there, there are some other cool applications, but as far as list building goes, I think you're planning on putting this on your Hive Guard almost every turn, and then every once in a while you yeah. put it on a Devourer Gaunt unit, but it's almost always Hive Guard. 
That's fair. All right, Psychic Creep is up next. This is on Neurothrope. Uh, uses the following ability. Has an aura. While an enemy unit was in six of this unit, subtract one from the leadership characteristic of models in that enemy unit and subtract one from combat attrition tests. Never heard of it. If that if that Neurothrope is within aura range of freaking anything in this game, that guy is dead. Uh, at least that's how I see it. Yeah, that's exactly Gentlemen? right. It's, uh, it's yet another morale phase rule. Uh, you know, I always joke that uh, one day they're going to release Night Lords. I'm going to go look up every other type of uh, combat attrition <laughs> modifier in the game. But for right now, yeah, yeah I, it's fine. Again, the Neurothrope is one that was very commonly in lists. And uh, mm. if it's there and you've got 15 points and you somehow didn't already buy three, sure. But like, man, I'd rather have three extra gods, I think. Mm, I agree. I agree. And so, so, you know, you chuck this on a unit and you send it out and you've got minus one minus one leadership uh in a bubble and i just i don't know i've never found a leadership modifier to be all that relevant like i've never had a game decided by one i've never won a game because of one and i've never lost at the same time i've never lost because of one either is, is the morale phase just a, another dead phase the same as it was last edition it, it feels that way i mean the biggest thing is that i can't imagine wanting this in my list i could imagine mm. walking up to a table and being like you know what in this game i'd rather have psychic creep than etc but that's like one yeah. one in like 20 games that I actually want this. And certainly not enough that I'm going to take away some of the other choices, such as Focal Essence, to put Psychic Creep in. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Well, John, keep going. Tell us about the Absolutely. next one. Absolutely. So the next one is uh, Weaponized Gestation, which is uh, the Turvagon buff. And very simple. Uh, each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack, you can re-roll an unmodified wound roll of one or two. So... I actually like this. I like this quite a bit. Yeah, the Turvagon was definitely one of the the slackers as far as uh, signups went before. Mm. This is a really nice buff. Reroll ones and twos to wound on a targeted unit. Tyranids really don't have a lot of wound rerolls at all in the army. Um, so this is a very, very good one. Spot on. Alex, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as the actual rules on paper, uh, the rule obviously is just crazy strong. Um, it just happens to be attached to a Turagon body, and I just still don't value that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, actually, Turagons would be one of my favorite models in, in the range for lore, fluff, and actual physical model-wise. Um, and it's been so... I mean, I've never seen it be good. I've, I've seen it be used by some, and by some you know, middling players and some very good players for very specific reasons um but even at the same time i've never found it to be something that's scary but now there's also a prospect of that one unit you know is a psyker can spawn you gaunts can be toughness eight with minus one to wound and be giving out a meaningful buff i mean i don't know if it's enough but it's a lot better than where it was uh alex you want to tell us about the next absolutely oh you get the trigon prime one lucky boy look at this <laughs> Uh, this unit is eligible to shoot and declare a charge in a turn in which it fell back. If this was on anything but a Trigon Prime, anything this else. would be so good. Oh man, <laughs> put that on something that can go and babysit your Hive Guard, and your Hive Guard just never get to be shut yeah. down anymore. Exactly. And that's in a 195 point Trigon Prime at the back of the board. I mean, if it was uh, if it was on a 45 point Marshall. <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah. feigned, freaking feigned retreat, the bastards. That um, would be completely broken, though, right? <laughs> right, right. That'd be unreasonable, wouldn't it? John, is there anything to this? Um, it, It's to the point where I really did look at the Trigon Prime. Because, you know, Trigon Prime's a character. You can give it that same minus one to wound relic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, I think that this is really good. And it's one of those the ones that I kind of want to pencil in for later. Where maybe if we mm -hmm. get a chapter approved before the next Nid Codex... And maybe that chapter approved makes the Trigon Prime a little bit less expensive. He's not that expensive right now. It's just that he doesn't do much. So um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm kind of like hoping this one comes up. But right now, I think it's a very good rule on a very bad model. And that'll keep it out of a... Uh, it'll keep it away from us for now. For now. Agreed. Um, unchecked Ferocity is up next. Is the Tyranid Prime Synaptic Link. Each time a melee attack is made by a model in this unit, an unmodified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target. I am a big, big fan. Yeah, this is great. It is melee only. Uh, some of them are, you know, agnostic, mm -hmm. but even melee only, this is really strong. Yeah. Um, Alex, unpack it a little bit for us. Where do you see the applications here? Give us an example of where this one might come up. Uh, this is my favorite one. Uh, because I am just a sucker for gene stealers, and gene stealers are definitely the number one recipient of this. Mm -hmm. they, oh my gosh, it just makes them so disgusting. It allows them to attack targets they were never able to go for before. 
Um, yeah. Gene Steelers were always fantastic at killing hordes and kind of anything up to like mid to elite infantry. The second you went to like a two plus or uh, toughness five, then they really start to drop off in damage output. And now yeah. with auto wins, oh man, you don't care. The whole package, I literally just started to call it the full package. Uh, the full <laughs> package is double exploding sixes, chapter master rerolls, and uh, this, this auto wounding. You just roll for sixes. You just roll your yes, five you just, yeah. pack yeah. 16, you throw your 64 dice, you pull your sixes out, you roll the rest, you pull your sixes out, you take all your explosions, and you can just go either like go and kill a huge heavy target or go super wide and crush every single screen you put in front of mm. you. Um, yeah, the damage output from, tier, or from Gene Steelers just absolutely skyrockets. Yeah, I think it's absurdly good. John, is there any other applications apart from... Um Alex, beloved Jane Steelers? Um, I, obviously, I, I agree. It's great there. I think it's actually really good on Hormagons. It's just that we don't want them nearly as much as we want Jane Steelers. So I think that's where we're mostly going to see it. But, I mean, theoretically, this works on anyone. Um, it just weight of attack to, and low to mid-strength is where it's best. So, you know, a big unit of Raveners, uh, a big unit of Hormagons, a big unit of Jane Steelers, anything that's dropping a lot of dice at strength four or less, this is fantastic on really good value. Agreed. All right, and up next is Bioweapon Bond. This is Tyranid Warriors. Each time an attack is made by a model in this unit, add one to that attack's hit roll. Just plus one attack. Just So plus one to hit, sorry. just And it's attack, it's just, it's not merely, it's not shooting, it's just here you go, plus one to hit, enjoy. And the fact you can take this on a, on a troop unit, you know, that, that could be seen as a tax unit in a battalion that can be as small as three guys. I mean, how many points is three warriors? Uh, 51. 54. Oh yeah, is no, that sorry. The, I auto include adrenal glands. <laughs> <laughs> is that the cheapest option to buy one of these? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's very yeah, cheap and that one, and that one, good. it's very good. I actually right. think John, this is the best us. one uh, out there because of how cheap because it is to get. Cheap, like, I, I can, yeah, I can see an argument for the Malice Scepter or the Prime being better, but the fact of it is that I can see a list that doesn't have it, and I cannot imagine a list right now that doesn't just slot a, a three man warrior squad in with this at a minimum. Mm. Yo, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is auto include that this gets that tag well so so what is it so 154 with the adrenal glands plus 15 so you're not even playing 70 points for one of the best buffs in the game it's phenomenal yeah it's really 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 good and those guys it's still, it's still nine toughness four wounds that could just be sitting out a line of sight every time like you don't need line of sight to apply this yet and, as well which is another really and important they're a thing synapse unit which means which you kind of want exactly. a couple of synapse units to make sure that the, the chain mm. goes so having an extra synapse unit in both to give the leviathan you know high fleet buff and to make sure that your your Malice Scepter or your Prime can reach everything else in the army, having a couple extra Synapse units in is a really big deal for Leviathan. They made Synapse matter mm. for once, and, and a Warrior's a cheap way to get it. Yeah. Spot on. And this is the One only of the... unit that you can use to like really string that chain out, because you can take yeah. the only squad. Well, other than zone throws, but I don't... We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> the, the Warriors, you can string them way out, right? Like, if those bases are 40 with two inches in between... That bubble is not a twelve inch bubble. It's now like a like nineteen or twenty inch wide bubble. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, I th- yeah. Yeah, do you know what the? F- <laughs> I, I was like, I'm finally, finally, my Tyranid brothers and sisters can have a, a flying hive tyrant that hits on twos, and you only have to buy another whole unit to make it happen. I'm so happy for you guys. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sorry, in shooting because they got BS three plus for some damn reason. Yeah. Um, all right, John, take us away. Tell us about the last one. All right, uh, the last one is uh, the only 10.1, which is good because it, I think it is not great, but 10 points. So yeah. psychic channeling on a zone throw unit. Each time a psychic test is taken for this unit, roll one additional D6 and discard one of the dice. Um, again, this unit is not the zone throws. It's a unit that it puts the command phase buff on. So it could be the zone throws mm-hmm. or it could be anything else. Um, I mean, this is a generically good thing. Again, if you told me I could pay 10 points for psychic channeling, I think I would put that in my list every single time. It's just I have to already have zone throws, and I have to have not yeah. taken three of these links already. And that's where mm-hmm. it gets just a little hard to justify. Where it's fine again if zone throws get good in the future, I'm very happy to revisit this. Right now, it doesn't make the cut, but you know we can't have everything be a winner when there's a cap of three. Agreed. Um, I'm assuming you feel the same way, Alex. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a good ability attached to a bad body. Um, it, yeah, spot on. Same, same as the Trigon Prime. Like it, it, yeah. tr- they're both quite good and justifiable, but it's the, the fact that you have to take that unit. I mean, 
there isn't that much competition in the heavy support slot, is there? But there is. A, is I seem like there's, there's more competition in the elite slot, yeah. Tons of competition in the elite slot, which is where yeah. the uh, zone throws live. Zone throw, yeah. Yep. Mm. Um, all right, just summing this up, I think uh, this is a good addition. What do you guys think? The the for the synoptic bonds. Oh, this is fantastic, and th- this is also not for Leviathan. We should clarify that. Yes. Yeah. So exactly we right. Have a so Leviathan everybody has this, and we have synaptic links, which are for any Tyranid army. So theoretically, your Kraken or Kronos could use this synaptic link part of this. Yeah. Mm. To put this into perspective, because of how good these are, this is actually enough to make me debate in the future if I will actually be using Leviathan. And I'll tell you the very specific thought I'm thinking is that we have about a month away or so, and then we get a gene stealer called Codex. I'm uh-huh. a sucker for forces of the hive mind. I'm already looking at ways like what would I run? How would I pare my Tyranids down to run mostly Gene Stealer Cult and some Tyranids? And I think it's completely viable to have a small Kronos attachment again with yes. a plus one to hit, a reroll damage, and a uh, Hive Guard with reroll ones to hit because you're in Kronos and Symbio Storm. And then so, that's your big backfield shooter. Hmm. And then you've got, you know, uh, 1300 or so points of GSE. Uh, yeah, I, like, I was about to say when, when you said uh, a little bit of tyranny is with thing. I was like, I want to say some hive guard with you. So you want some hive guard with your with your G Stealer cult. But um, yeah, I, I think this is an amazing addition, and the fact that it's not just for Leviathan, I think, is quite exciting. So dedicated hive fleet players. If you did, if you if you're this just makes Kraken better. This just makes this just makes um you know Kronos better. This just makes all of them better, as far as I can tell. Um, but gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the content for High Fleet Leviathan. Now, there's two usual things we go through at the end of this. Um, I would like to you guys to – I'll go over to John first. To rate this out of 10 for how good it is for Tyranid players. Uh, as in not as in how good it is as, as in like, oh, this is the best supplement ever. I guess other supplements, but how good this is for giving new stuff, giving new life to Tyranid players. I'm going to give this a solid 9. It's not quite wow. yep. the – you know, it's not as broken as broken can be, but mm-hmm. and I think that this is actually okay purely because of where Tyranids were. If Orcs or Admech were to get these kind of rules, I think it actually would be very, very unhealthy for the game, as it is you're yes. just elevating a middle army close to the top. Uh, yeah, 9 out of yep. 10. There's, there's a few duds in here, like there's one or two strats that aren't that great, but there's enough good strats to make up for it. There's three good warlord traits Agreed. that you can't actually take all of, uh, there's a couple relics that are duds, but there's at least one good relic to make up for it. Um, across the board, there's enough in here to make a Tyranid happy, player happy in every dimension. Uh, it's not the perfect 10, but man, this is about as close as we get nowadays. Fantastic. Alex, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'll give it an 8. Um, I have one more specific point um, that bugs me, and that is that we didn't get defensive stuff. Tyranids I was about to say. are an army that just are not durable anymore. Their durability mm-hmm. in the past has been, we are a horde, can you bring this horde down? And the answer from all of the best armies is no problem. <laughs> no issues at all. Yeah. So um, I would have liked to have some defensive capabilities thrown in here, one mm-hmm. or two more. Um, other than that, I really enjoy what's in here. Um, the other complaint, yet, you know, I even ate. The other one is that they didn't do anything to resurrect bad stuff that no one was using. They just that, used stuff that was yeah. already popular and like cranked mm-hmm. it. It really feels like that, doesn't it, though? It really feels like they went into it and was like, well, what, what, in, what is already good in NIDS? And then they just dialed it up two or three notches on the power level for the stuff that was already good. And for that reason, I'm giving it, I think I'm giving it a seven. Taking off two points from the 10 because they didn't, it didn't give them a new playbook. It just added to the existing one, which I feel like it, too many players are not going to complain because you've already got the army that is going to be good for this book, and that's exciting. You don't have to run out and you know drop five hundred points or whatever, uh, five hundred dollars rather, five hundred points. Um, and I'll, I'll dock one point simply because yeah, there's no no defensive buffs, but a, a really good seven out of ten, possibly. Well, for the existing Tyranid players, the diehards, um, because you're already playing with this book, I feel like it's almost like Grey Knights in that respect. You already have the army; you don't need to run out and get anything. You just pick this up and go with it. Actually, no, I'm giving it an eight because of the ease of play. Because of how good it is for the players already playing the army, I mean, you just drop your Dimecarons, add a couple of sprinkle in some bits and pieces, put the gene seals back in, and you're pretty much good to go. Um, all right, will this change? I will start with John first. Currently, right now, I think I'll, I might have to double check and make sure I'm not lying, but I feel like uh, Nids are sitting in upper C or lower B tier as as of our last um, rankings episode. I'll just jump back and check now. But how far do you think this puts them up? Does this shake up where they sit right now in the competitive lexicon? One hundred percent. I if I were to assign a value to this, I would say lower A. Um, I I if I don't know 
where you put the other armies, frankly. I would say that this puts Tyranids ever so slightly ahead of uh, Sisters of Battle and Space Marines in the, assuming that you have those two ranked similarly, because I do. Um, I would hmm. say it puts them right around that level, but maybe just slightly ahead. They are right now they're towards the bottom of B tier. So they're they're around a B to a B minus as it sits in our rankings. Um so you're saying yeah, it, it drops them up a whole two positions as he goes past yeah. B, goes past um, B plus straight to A minus. That's pretty good, yeah. really. If, if we were like, doing a ranking good. system just to A people here, I would say that they are now the number five army in the game. Wow, that is a huge call. Write that down, guys. That is big, big, big deal. You can expect some awesome things. So what is who they knock off out of the top five? Because my top five right now would be, you know, Admech, Drakari. Orcs, Grey Knights, and so what? They they bump off sisters, or they bump off who? I I had sisters as number five. Uh, and I think yeah, I sisters uh, number five as well. So uh, yeah, both on the direct matchup and how they pair into the field, I think this knocks sisters down. Beautiful, Alex. Your thoughts? Where, where does this change him? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I would not go A minus. I would go like just straight A, maybe even A plus. Um, wow. I I don't know. I just look at what I can do now, and it's so much stronger. Um, mm-hmm. They have some. Because of the lack of defense, they have some extremely polarizing matchups into the top. Um, like I think they will get absolutely just dumpstered by flying orcs and Agmac, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think there's a whole lot of other matchups they have that are like yeah negative. Like I think I've got a game into Grey Knights, but definitely mm-hmm. into Sisters, even Drakari now. Um, they scare me far less with what I've got now. Um, uh, yeah. That's that's the one matchup that I think got the biggest buff. I think that I think the matchup into Admech is almost the same. It's a, of, of all of them, it's almost the same. Grey Knights might be very similar as well, but I feel like the I feel like the Drakari matchup got so much better from this book, right? Yeah, just the fact that we can demech the Drakari mm. so much quicker is a massive step up in the in the matchup. Um, I unfortunately fear that we will eventually be lumped into the armies that are bad for the game because no one is going to want to play against 11 high guard that never miss and real yeah. their damage yeah uh, and, and they, they so you feel like they're just going to be another mm-hmm. alpha strike archetype not an alpha strike definitely not um the the dynamics are definitely um different than what orcs and admech are doing but it, mm-hmm. i think a lot of times it will feel the same way as maybe playing against Drukari, where it's like, it'll be fun at first where you're like look at all the stuff i'm killing i'm killing all these raiders and all these guys are dying and then you still just lose anyway and it'll be the same yeah. thing. Like the, the hive guard aren't gonna just delete your army turn one, but by turn four, the person realizes, like, oh crap, I'm never ever getting to interact with these hive guard every single yeah. turn. Yeah. Just keep pulling stuff off the board, and yeah. then they'll start to get old. Well, I, I fear stuff like if people uh, there are some armies that just have profiles. Uh, sorry, we should talk about this in part two. Um, <laughs> but there, there are some armies out there that just have profiles of de- like defensive profiles that are just really susceptible to Hive Guard, like really susceptible. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I fear for them um, moving forward from this place because they're they're the same guys that are really susceptible to Orcs as well. So they will just kind of double down on a lot of their problems. Um, but gentlemen, we'll bring this to an end unless there's anything in addition that we think we've missed or you'd like to talk to before we wrap up. No, I think we've, uh, we've covered all my thoughts on this one. I'm really, really excited. It, it's enough to make me put the Tyranids on the table again, start painting some bugs. Uh, mm. Hopefully I'll take them to some tournaments, but at the very least, uh, Tyranids were an army that needed love, and it's nice to see one of these supplements buff an army that didn't get a codex last month. It- Spot freaking on from my thoughts. Actually, throwing a bone to an army that's languishing, not one that's already in, in is like a, approaching a zenith, and and just giving it an extra push up Everest is how I feel about some of the previous ones, especially Strife and Veteran Cohort. Um, Alex, anything else to add? No, I'm good. All right, boys. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate that. Thank you to everybody for all your continued and incredible support of Art of War Down Under and Art of War. Go over to the War Room. Jump. Get involved in one of the most amazing and positive communities out there, and also, you know one of the deadliest and most competitive shark tanks in the known world. But on that note, gentlemen, thank you very much. You have a great night. We'll go over and record part two. Now we're going to be talking about list construction, archetypes, good and bad matchups. And then uh, we're going to unpack a little bit of this, this, uh, these new lists that both these gentlemen I know have been piloting to some success behind the scenes and uh, talk to some of your listener questions. So please come over and join us. Um, the art of war down under our Patreon or the art of war 40k.com. Hope to see you there. Good night, John. Good night, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. Thank you for listening to Art of War Down Under, a content review podcast for Warhammer 40K. 
Hosted by Adam Camilleri. Produced by Seamus Ronan. Enjoyed the show? Want your lists reviewed and the content you heard put into practice? Sign up to our Patreon and connect with us online or on Facebook. Just search for Art of War Down Under. Signing out from tomorrow.